Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Richard Lewis Show. And joining me this time around, uh, it is one of the legends of the Dota talent scene, uh, someone I'm a big fan of. Uh, I think in many ways, kind of like a, a Richard Lewis uh, type figure in the talent pool, but just uh, attractive and not overweight. Uh, so it is the legend, <laughs> Kyle Friedman. There you go. That's a great intro. Uh, self-deprecating and high praise. Uh, but thanks so much. Yes, thanks so much for joining <laughs> me as you uh, plod around and deal with jet lag. Oh, yeah. it's I'm um, glad to be here. It's funny because we've uh, had like a Twitter to- uh, correspondence for years. We've never done any kind of content, worked a show together or anything like that. So cool to yeah. uh, get into it. Nice to get over the hump uh, in, in that regard, I think. Uh, but yeah, you know, look, it's no joke. I mean, I'll, I'll start with some flattery. I'm told uh, on a first date, that is what you're supposed to do. Um, I'll start with some flattery. I mean, look, I, I've I've followed, um, you know, your work for a long time. And obviously we've been talking for a while. Uh, definitely an admirer of what you do, because I think you occupy a pretty unique position in the Dota talent pool in the sense that, one of the problems I've always had with Dota and Dota broadcasts is that there's not a lot of people who just sort of tell it like it is. There's not a lot of people who lean into being the villain of the broadcast when it comes to uh, a player's played bad, a team's made a mistake, uh, a roster move hasn't worked out. There generally seems to be a consensus among talent, and I know because I talk to them privately that yeah the the community doesn't really appreciate it when you give it to them straight they want all the players to be you know fluffed and everything's got to be super nice and it's always a positive Mm -hmm. spin and you sort of deviate from that and i think for a broadcast that's super important yeah i mean i would agree i think uh the role of a, a broadcaster in any form is just to kind of channel the like emotions of the game or whatever it is you're watching Mm. um I think in Dota, there's a bit of reluctance for that because we have at times like, I, I mean, you guys are Counter-Strike. You guys go off. You know, I've heard like <laughs> yeah. to quote like, man, that was fucking garbage. They're <laughs> going to need to play a lot better if they want to win anything. Otherwise, we just throw this roster out. You know, you guys are like har- are harsh. In Dota, we've had, you know, criticisms of a draft and like you'll get a, a, a player in your DMs like, hey, man, I don't appreciate that. Um so it's definitely it's something i think you know i played so a lot of the times if i flame somebody i'm probably harsher on people i actually know and have a relationship with Mm. because they they also don't care right like i've known um insania who's now the captain of liquid for like 12 years at this point so like what what can i say that's really gonna hurt his feelings you know even if i'm harsh like i think that the the best players you see this in pro sport as well. Like they kind of eat criticism. They use it as motivation. And I feel going back to when I was a player, if I play like garbage, then by all means, like you have a right to call me out for it. If I, if I don't want, if I want to have the, the, the glory when I get that win and suddenly you're, you're adored all over socials, then the counterpoint to that is when you lose or when you drop your yules, you're going to get clowned on. And that's just Mm. part of life. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I always think uh, it, it's like an obligation that you have to the viewer in a way, even though I understand that the Dota community don't really appreciate it because they have this kind of like disproportionate admiration for the players uh, compared to any other aspect uh, of the scene. Um, but I think, you know, if a player plays bad and a player makes a mistake or they, you know, in Dota, they itemize wrong in your opinion or whatever, um, I think you owe it to the viewer to not like sugarcoat it. I mean, I think it's an important part of a broadcast. You know, you wouldn't get it in, say, football, where if someone makes a terrible mistake, uh, you, you you don't go, oh, well, I'm sure, you know, 99 times out of 100, they would get that right. Or maybe in that moment, what he was thinking was he was going to do it this yeah. way. It's like, no, you say like it, they, they fucked up. You, you yeah. tell it like it is because that's what the viewer can see on the screen. That's probably what they're thinking. Yeah. Dota is especially complicated in that regard, just because there's typically there are more. There's always more than one thing that leads to a loss. And a lot of times it's, you know, somebody misses a TP. The, the game is so complex that you can watch it with four different people. They'll all have a different opinion on what the key element of the draft or of gameplay that went wrong was. So it's, I think, you know, 
it's probably the easiest game to work. Like I have more respect for you guys. Cause you know, I watch a lot of counter-strike, but at the end of the mm. day, it's like, well, did you shoot that guy in the head? Well, you, you, they should have shot that guy in the head faster. Cause then they would have won the round. You know, mm. Dota, I can, you know, I, I could go on for hours about some game because you just hit different elements of it and you can just forever. Yeah, it's um, you know, I I I get that there's like this uh uh, you know, different aspects to the game, but you know, having talked to a lot of talent, uh, the general consensus among fans seems to arrive somewhere at between you should show players respect, and it's not nice to be critical. Mm -hmm. That's at one end of the spectrum, and then you go, oh well, surely at the other end you're allowed to be critical, and then you get to the other end, and the other end is you're not a pro player, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And that yep. doesn't really give you a lot of wriggle room as a spectrum yeah. for discussion, right? I, I feel like it's a, uh, well, that's the job, right? You got to try to be tactful. I think that occasionally you'll be a little too harsh. There were a couple of times where I like reached out. I remember, um, I think it was at some event like three or four years ago. And I implied that uh, this team wasn't trying and like, mm. whether they were, was the circus in town because they looked like a bunch of fucking clowns. And, and that was, maybe a little rude because they um like they were trying they just got owned you know but yeah they they their main point was look if we play terrible call us out for it but we're always trying to win and i i can understand that um but i think you have to have those sorts of moments because otherwise if you if you don't ever like if you're not ever too harsh that means that you're likely on the other end of that spectrum and you're not being as honest as you as you should be yeah so, look, I have an ulterior motive uh, for bringing on the iconoclastic Kyle. Uh, and that is because there's a lot of, and again, I don't want to be reductive and call it drama uh, in mm -hmm. the Dota scene um, right now. I, you know, it's, it's way more important than that. But certainly there's been a cascading effect of it's led to lots of drama and people saying things. Uh, but ultimately, the uh, Dota 2 major has been cancelled uh mm. out of out of nowhere which and and done in a way where points are going to be just added on to the next two majors which are of course theoretical at this point if we're not doing mm -hmm. this one we might not do ones in future uh and so uh it's effectively rendered all of this dpc so far just fucking pointless like just a, a waste of time and yeah. so this has led to a lot of negativity around the current state of competitive dota the current state of Valve's handling of it as an eSport, and also just the sort of current state of communication channels between the developer and the people that essentially are probably mm -hmm. competitive side of things. So lots to talk about, but just give me yeah. your initial reaction when you heard the news. Um, <laughs> I, unfortunately, I would say I wasn't surprised um i'm pretty connected in the dota sphere and nobody was doing the major and everybody was kind of wondering who was doing the major and all the people that would have known didn't know and then we got this news um yeah. and i'm also when it comes to dota and its current state in the acceptance stage of uh the five stages of grief so i i i don't want to say i saw it coming but it didn't surprise me. Mm. Um, I wanted to, I want to definitely you know, give, I don't want to call shout out or what, but I think the outpouring of, of grief, of despair after the announcement really lit a candle, uh, lit a fire under the, both the community, other players, talents, like pretty much everybody had a take because it, you know, COVID, COVID sucks. And you can understand the reasons behind like canceling the major. It's the lack of communication and the sort of just hand waving this that I think ticked a lot of people off. Because you know, I'm we're we're old, man. Like you got gray hairs in your beard. I'm starting to pull gray hairs out of my head. And and the thing that this matters more not to not just in my view, beard, by the way, not that you need that information, but you know, you, <laughs> you have a you have a tendency to get them all over just for future uh, <laughs> great visual for the viewers at home, Richard. Jesus. Um, <laughs> what is it? Um, the kids, the, the, the yeah. 19 year old mid player, you know, uh, like I'll uh, look at OG, you know, iconic roster, the old legends retired, no tail Seb, they hung it up. And now we've got these like 17 year old kids mm. who have qualified to their first major and, and they've been sold like this dream 
right? Like you can go win TI, biggest tournament in all of esports. And and the path to that now is a little murky. Um, not to mention in Europe, you've got this squad, Team Tickles. And in North America, you have Quincy Crew, who mm. currently is they're the number one team in North America. They mm-hmm. dumpster EG, they're undefeated. And they're going to receive for their efforts, bear in mind, no sponsor. So they're funding all this. They flew this kid, Pon Lowen, from Singapore. He spent Christmas in America alone, although the team should have invited him to one of their houses for Christmas. They didn't. He spent it alone. And he's been in America for now, I think, almost two or three months. They're going to win about $4,000 a player for four months or so of playing. And that's it. The DPC yeah. also prevents third-party events from running efficiently. So this is all they're playing for. They don't get the major. They don't get support. The, the prize pool of the major just sort of fizzled and disappeared. And I think in a quick summary, everyone has a right to be real, to be real mad. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's a weird one because um, I'm probably going to say some controversial shit here just out of the gate. Um, but but here's my read on it. I think if you're organizing an event in the current climate, and that current climate is we've been in a fucking pandemic for two years, and the industry standard is that we aren't just going to muddle through we're gonna we're gonna try and make events as safe as possible for fans if they're in attendance certainly for players and talent so two years into that um if you're running an event just on the proviso it's gonna be like an old school land event where you just turn up and who gives a shit if you get the dreaded cough or whatever uh well, no, no one is doing that now. So you have to have a contingency. Mm-hmm. And that contingency could be, we'll do it online. Not ideal, but it's better than nothing. Or that contingency could be, right, it's a major, but it's not really a major. We'll do it in land conditions, but we'll run a bubble. Like, there's got to be a plan B. Everybody needs a plan B. I would say it's good practice even in the good old days before COVID to have a fucking plan B, because you never know what's going to happen. Geopolitical shit, you know, travel restrictions. It's all sorts of madness. Remember, Dota is a very global game. I don't need to tell you that. Yes. And obviously, so w- when you have, let's say, nations that have underlying tensions that aren't going to be mm-hmm. resolved through the medium of esports, literally anything can happen. And we've seen that in the past historically in esports. So seems to me a company like Valve should have a contingency plan. And I think that's why so many people or certainly as a casual, I guess you would call me that, um, you know, it, it's disappointing because it just seems like it should have been the easiest thing in the world to pivot to, <laughs> to, to an event of some sort, be it online or be it just the teams in a LAN environment. Uh, yeah. Um, so there's a lot to unpack. Um, I think a good place to start is to try and understand, like the, I I always try to fight, you know, if you figure out why something happens, you typically understand it a bit better. And, um, wow. When was this? The December 3rd to 10th, I think it was 2016. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the Boston major. This Mm -hmm. is five years ago. Mm -hmm. I was still playing at the time and I've always been like who I am. Like I, I never shut up, you know, it's uh, and I, and I always enjoyed land events because that was really the first place in my life that I always felt like I belonged, you know, going all the way back to dream hacks in early 2010. Right. So I was shooting the shit in like the ops room with a couple of uh, the event staff and a couple of valve employees. And I was talking about how, Unlike a few past events, at this event in Boston, um, they weren't providing food. Um, there wasn't catering and there was no like place where people would go and eat and stuff. And, and I thought that they should, um, partly because, and I, I feel like it's very easy to spin this as being entitled, but the reasoning is one, you had some teams there that had not won any money. You know, you, you bring in guys from like South America with $2,000 total prize pool earnings. It's the winter and it is so cold. It's freezing. And I believe at the time it was like the third or fourth most expensive city in America. Mm-hmm. Not to mention, I feel like if you're throwing a competitive event and the 
the standard of care, if you go to any other TO, was like they were going to give you food. There'd be some yeah. meal room, which also I think fosters like community, right? Because I'm not going to leave my practice room, but oh, I've got to go here to eat food. I'm mixing with talent. I'm mixing with other teams. Again, this is before COVID. And I, and I like, I like that. I, I like that there was always a place to go to just hang out as the community at these big events, which were celebrations of the game that we all love. And I brought these points up to, to a Valve employee there. And the response I got um, was uh, verbatim, Kyle, no offense, but don't we think, don't you think we give you guys enough already? And, and hear me out. This, this is really what I think this whole discussion comes down to, which is what do you view like competitive esport as? If you look at Dota and, and the Valve mentality, I believe is still very much the same as it was five years ago, mm. which is that what we have, this competitive scene, uh, my career, uh, a player's career is not necessarily something that they've earned, but a privilege granted to them by the owners of our game. And you can agree with that or disagree with that, but ultimately that is the mentality that I believe creates all of this frustration and why the game is handled as it is. Mm. Um, sorry to keep monologuing, but you probably saw like the manager of EG. Uh, yeah, I read, his, I read his tweet longer, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so a key word from that was, um, let me pull up the quote. Um, that Valve didn't want people to, to talk or, or complain publicly on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, a video went viral, ironically, of the team that then went on to win the event, Team Spirit, where they were in a practice room and their chairs, like if they reclined, <laughs> would hit the person behind them's chair. Yeah. They're, they're in a box, you know, a room smaller than the one I'm in. And this is, um, this is a $40 million tournament. So... There was obviously some frustration. There was a team meeting and the word from Eric Johnson himself was effectively, you know, we do this because it's fun. When you guys do stuff like this, it makes it less fun for us. And it makes us want to run TI less, you know, kind of saying, Hey, shut up because you're making our job annoying. And we don't do this for us. This is not about the money for us. It's about you. And mm. we're giving this to you. So be grateful because we don't have to. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, so just my, my initial reaction when I read that, um, and I talked about this a little bit on my um, Spotify podcast, is that mm. it seems staggering to me that Valve would even attempt to frame it, that this is something we do for fun when we all know how much of, you know, so TI, they sell the compendium. And they immediately pocket off the top before any of that money is sort of distributed. You know, they 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 pocket what is it like fucking twenty five percent million or so? Yeah, they so, get seventy five. Yeah, seven. Oh, there you go. Uh, I'm I'm being way too generous. Uh, so yeah, it's twenty five that goes into the final thing. That's right. So the idea that it's like some like benevolent. We, we just do it for the sheer fun and love of the game. Like, fuck off. You make hundreds of millions off the bat. Like, that, that's before we even get into anything else that's in the game. Um, it, that, that is a crazy framing. Also, I mean, let's, let's also just be honest. You know, Valve have had <clears throat> a few swings and a miss in other projects lately. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, when, when you're a games developer or a tech company we all know the inherent value whether you're publicly traded or not in having lots of uh positive public stories about your company and this belief that things that you're doing are good and when you've got something like oh i don't know the steam deck coming out uh you know having a, a solid gaming product that's free to play on your games distribution platform is actually a massive W, right? So there is not, they're not doing this because they're just a bunch of wacky guys in a startup who just love video games. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing this because it makes them a lot of fucking money. So 
I couldn't believe that. I, I couldn't believe anyone at Valve would say that with a straight face. Um, and that, so, and then just on top of that, the idea that hey, criticism hurts our feelings. Uh, so if you criticize us, we'll stop doing the thing that we're all here to do. I, uh, it's that is some Riot Games bullshit. That's not the Valve I know. I mean, I was I was genuinely surprised when I saw that. Uh, it does make money, but I think that uh, the community at large, like we don't, we won't know. But you know, Steam's game distribution platform. Uh, you know, if you sell a game on Steam, mm. uh, Valve take a thirty percent cut. And yeah. you're also locked to not sell that game cheaper on any other distribution platform. So even if, you know, some other store is taking 12%, the price has to be the same if you want to sell on Steam. Uh, this combined with the Steam marketplace make like an astronomical amount of money. And I would argue that Valve as a company, whatever they're doing with Dota, you know, they just set a new record for concurrent users on Steam. It's like mm. 29 and some odd million. So I, I think that the view is very much that, you know, here we have like, the, we have this Dota 2 sandbox that we've created, okay? And we're all, we're all playing in it and doing what we can. And the idea is, it's not that the sandbox isn't valuable to us, it's that we have all these other sandboxes that are making us more money, and we can also invest our time and energy into making new sandboxes in other spheres and other areas that have significantly more upside. Mm. So why would we waste our time on, on something like this where our ceiling is so much lower than if we were to, you know, go drop a Steam Deck or or make the the new VR. And this attitude, especially when discussed with players, for me is just like, hey, we don't have to mind your sandbox, right? You, you can just we can just leave and go do stuff in these other areas, and you won't have a place there. Mm. There won't be anything for you because you're just in Dota. So. This, I again, feel like it comes back to this discussion of does a publisher who owns the IP, because I we can't go do something else. Like we can't just make a Dota circuit because right now we're in this weird, like Zugzwang where Valve have control, but not as much investment or like it's not important enough to them as mm. it would be to an independent TO, like say an ESL, who would have a contingency plan. You know, Valve wants a major with fans. If they can't have that, okay, well, whatever, we'll just cancel it. If this is an ESL event, like they have sponsor obligations. They have, they need to have a contingency. This event must happen and it will happen in some form that will be safe. Or they would have a clear outline for what happens if it has to be canceled, what would the replacement event be? And this would all be communicated with their partners. Whereas in Dota, everyone from you, to some guy on Twitter, to me, to the managers and CEOs and players on these top teams finds out at the same exact time that the major is canceled. So, yeah, I mean, look, it, it's, it's, it, it's staggering as well, because I mean, I could tell genuinely from the reactions, like it was completely out of left field. And also, mm -hmm. um, like you said, if people haven't even been approached to work the event, then it, it's been it's clear for a while the event wasn't going ahead. You've yeah. got you've got to book people's time, man. So uh, it, it it's it's staggering to me that there's like a framing that this is just one of those unfortunate realities because yeah. of like new developments because of the dread Omicron variant. And it's like, guys, it, it's not going anywhere. Uh, I, I hate to break it to you all. Uh, There'll be another variant and another, you know, we, we just have to live like this now and we've got to muddle through. And by the way, it's not even like some new development. Like this is shit that was going on last year. So it, it doesn't fly. My, my concern with a lot of this stuff is because I know companies are quite cynical uh, and they like to push the boundaries of what they can get away with. I almost feel that there was almost in the back of their minds. Let's schedule a major, see how things are. If suddenly there's like a click your fingers, COVID goes away situation, yeah. we'll do the event. But anything else, we just won't do it in the Dota community yeah. elite shit. Yeah, I think it's also possible, like not many people were motivated to run it. 
Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, in a CSGO major, Valve pays for all the flights and accommodations and logistics mm -hmm. for players, yeah? Mm -hmm. In Dota, that's not the case. Valve puts up half of the prize pool, so 250K out of the 500. Um, consider that due to the DPC system, this first major had about 60% of the value of the last major. It was also going to be held during a, a, an outbreak of a new COVID variant, during winter, where obviously you're not really able to do as much stuff outside. And there'd be a two month lead time to make any sales on the event instead of six to eight, right? Yeah. I, I, if I'm running a tournament, I want to do it in August. I want to do the last major, the most important one, rather than this coming up. Because, you know, another issue, and, and ironically, as we're filming this, there's another meeting going on right now between a bunch of the top managers and, and Valve, because when sufficiently motivated, they are still capable of moving mountains. They just unfortunately are not necessarily motivated by the things that would keep you going, but rather I think either major embarrassment or revenge. That's how you really like get Valve to go and, and start kicking ass. So when you have your, your new superstars literally crying about whether or not they've wasted their lives pursuing their dreams, mm. you know, that that's enough to like get things going. Um, so in some cases, I hope that this is like a real catalyst for change because ultimately the, the same issue has been present in Dota for, for some time where Valve are, are both hands-on and hands-off. And I, I wrote about this like during COVID. When yeah, I remember had, that. Yeah, yeah. Like we had zero information, right? The TI was just pushed back and we heard nothing, absolutely nothing. And it was the same scenario where it's like, okay, like Valve, you have what you want, right? You have monopolized uh, in-game monetization. Uh, we, we now have teams that can do something. We'll get to the fan bundles. But as a tournament organizer, if you want to sell a battle pass, like that is all Valve. It used to be something other TOs could do. Now it is just Valve. Mm. And they had taken like the community's money, right? They had spent, they had gotten this battle pass. There was like 160 million going to Valve, 40 million in the prize pool. And the event was just pushed back. And there was zero communication. And like the DPC as it stands is really rough because it's so long. It is six weeks. This last one, because it was a holiday break, was eight, eight and a half weeks where you're locked into this, playing only about one match per week, right? Mm. Eight teams in the division, seven matches in this six week span. You know, Dota's got a lot of international teams. I like, you know, I'll use Ice 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 as an example. He's a Singaporean. Mm. He's got a, a wife and a kid. He has to be in America to play this event for like effectively the whole year. You know, you look at a team like Secret, they have players from five different regions. To boot camp, it's, it's a lot. It's all coming together and they just simply aren't playing enough Dota. You're in, you're in grind mode. You're, you're trying to keep yourself at your athletic peak and you get one match per week. And the stakes are, are basically DPC points. You know, mm. first place, 28K, second, 27, 26, 25. You're not playing for money. You're playing for DPC points, which is effectively just a share of the TI prize pool because our entire scene revolves around TI. And because you've always had this, um, you know, it's a competitive game. And I think you'll never get this organized solution from the player base or the teams, et cetera, because a guy like Puppy, who's played at every single TI probably loves this system. Like he doesn't care. He wants there to be $40 million in TI because he's going to be there. He's going to compete for it. Mm. His incentives are very different from say the 16 year old kid going to high school in Lima, Peru, or in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, who needs to make enough money to live so that he can pursue his dream. Yeah. So, I mean, so just on that topic, um, you know, I, I saw in the sort of aftermath of the drama, I saw Mason, everyone's favorite uh, Dota streamer, um, say, you know, that like, should a, should a professional Dota player make more than minimum wage? Uh, fuck no. And fuck uh, anyone that wants that. And they're just super entitled. If you want to make money at Dota, get good. That seemed to be the kind of through fare of his uh, thought process. Um, and so... You know, I'm I'm of the opinion that there has to be 
a salary that's commensurate to the labor and expertise you're essentially selling mm-hmm. for that. Um, at, but within within the confines that not all uh, jobs are created equal, uh, not just because of how we value them as a society, but because of ecosystems and 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 what is a sustainable salary for the value it generates. So yeah. the question then becomes that unfortunately right now, I've talked to a lot of team owners, many of them on this show, and they all say the same thing. The ecosystem with Dota is fundamentally broken. It is fucked. They, they cannot monetize the game. They'd love to be involved. They'd love to support a team and have all of the glory of going to TI. That's great. Mm-hmm. Everything else sucks. And so I, I, I don't I don't know how you feel about the idea that, sure, it, it is great for Puppy, and it's not so great for a young and upcoming kid that maybe has to play for no salary at all. But realistically, where are the revenue streams in Dota to generate that value so you can give that kid a salary? Where, where do you think they are? Well, hmm. Right now, it yeah. it stands with Valve. For the future, you know, I look at uh, it's really funny how like the the CS:GO and the Dota side, like we all look at Valve's relationship with our game and, and think the other side has it better. Mm. Um, I don't think it's possible right now to generate a product that would actually create this ecosystem. Um, I think of all the things that exist in esport right now. Um, I'll exclude League because it's a solely publisher initiative, but ESL Pro League is probably the best thing that we have. It is the best thing that's been built without a publisher. And that creates in- immense value in the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Like even years ago when, um, when I was still on Complexity, we were the second best team in America. We went to like 80% or so of the lands we were everywhere and we were getting paid like a third as much as our counter-strike team, which at the time was like 12th in, in the U S you know, like no offense, they were really bad, but that was what you had to pay to get a team. Mm. And you can argue that uh, that's been a bubble for who knows how long, but I feel like it's just because there's, there's so much more freedom and there's hope, you know, in Dota, all of our hope from, from player, new like the new players to puppy to team owners to team owners that don't have teams is just hope that valve does something and and this is what happened to han and why it's put me in like the acceptance phase like i've seen this before where a publisher takes ownership of the competitive scene but doesn't have a firm enough grasp or a vision to actually execute and create this product that people can buy into Mm -hmm. and it slowly drives the other people who would out of the market into other games. And it pushes new players. You know, my youngest brother, uh, he's 18. And years ago, like he was thinking about playing Dota. And I, I told him, no, like, do not play pro Dota. Pick a different game. Um, and I understand the mentality of, you know, oh, just get good. Like this is pure. And it's something that makes Dota as an esport, especially TI, one of like the coolest things because it's literally just win TI. You want to be the most successful Dota player? You want to be a champion? You want to say that you're the best? Like just win TI. Mm. You're set for life. And, and it's a spectacle. You know, it is a fucking great event. The caveat to that is for those who are not, you know, if you're a top five Dota team, you're doing really, really well. If you're top 15, you're making like a living wage. And if you're outside of that, you're not making shit. Mm. And we just have to ask, like, is that okay? Is that what we want? And does that foster growth? You know, I, I know from talking to some of these guys, like, you know, no tail, he wants to, to be a team owner that wins TI. Now he mm. wants to be involved in Dota for the next decade. But right now, the only way that happens is if Valve give us their blessing, if they commit to continue doing this. Because I mean, even right now, we have no information about TI. When we, we have these team meetings where 
like valve employees themselves hint that, you know, maybe this, maybe we won't do this. Like, how does that make you feel confident to, as a stakeholder to keep investing in this game that you love at a certain point, the uncertainty is going to drive you elsewhere. Yeah. I, you know, it, it seems so bizarre that we're having this particular discussion because I thought finally they were starting to come around to, to seeing that one hand can very much wash the other when it comes to, you know, generating that value and having revenue streams. Uh, one of the reasons why so many North American CS owners, because real talk, North American esports owners are fucking bums. They, oh, yeah. they you know, <laughs> they 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 want to have you know everything done for them. They're not interested in doing it the risky way, where you know you 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 build a team, you invest in a team, and that team has to go and be excellent and win things and qualify to big tournaments. No, they want franchise slots, invites. Uh, they want a cut of all the rev share that's equally distributed. So there's not even any value necessarily in a lot of these like franchise leagues of being a better team than the one to your left. There's, you know, there's, mm-hmm. North American owners are uh, by and large a fucking joke. Um, so I sort of get the idea of like shrugging your shoulders and going, it is your job to generate the value for your business. I get that. But equally as well, I think when you have a platform like Steam and you have a game like Dota and you can put things like in-game items in the game, sell them, and you take a premium uh, and, and, and then that money is distributed to the org, to the players, I, I think we can all agree that everybody benefits from that, including, by the way, the the fans that get an opportunity to get some new content in their game and obviously support the teams they care about. So when I saw the new DPC stuff with the fantasy and all of the fucking, you know, I bought some Arkosh stuff. I'm a proud Arkosh supporter on my account. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I think all the viewers at home, you should also support Team Arkosh. It's a yeah. group of content creators. Yeah, uh, yeah, which uh, I'm sure you have nothing to do with. Uh, so no, no, no. <laughs> um, so you know, it's it, it's like when I saw that, I was like, wow, yeah, Valve are gonna get they're getting it now, and they real and and you know, because over in CS, the reason North American owners are leaving that game is because there's nothing like that for CS. You don't make any benefit from that. But, but from having a team, there's nothing to sell in the game. And, and everybody really, really wants that. Um, so to then sort of fast forward a few months down the road and they're going, oh, but if you hurt our wickle feelings, maybe we won't do TI. Mm-mm. It's like, I can't believe it's the same company. It seems it seems so tonally inconsistent. I, I would argue it's just, it's different. It's different companies though. Like, I, I don't want to make this entire thing about... Also, I forgot we can swear because it's your show because I've been holding back on the fucks. Um, oh, no, yeah, fuck that. I had my presenter, my presenter tonage on, but they're different companies. Mm. Like the Valve's flat structure is is famous and you pretty much work on, on what you want. But I think like the unknown aspect of this is that your your internal performance is, or or rather your internal perceived value in performance is tied into like how much money you're going to make Mm. because your your um like end of year review when you start getting into like bonuses and such these can be like six figures and demonstrating you have key value on an important product that that either brings you know immense value to the company in terms of revenue or in terms of prestige like that's a way to that's a way to like that that pays for your next kid, you know, like yep. we're, we're talking about huge sums of money. Um, and due to this, there's a lot of like internal politicking that goes on that I would argue at times is more important than the end result, because you want to make sure that when you work, move forward on things, it has like the entire group Zinkies behind it, because otherwise it could jeopardize your standing. You could be seen as, as, a, as an outsider. And then when it times to kind of end of year, the coppers are distributed suddenly you know you're you're not a team player or you didn't uh, have the value that someone else on the team did there is no dota like the dota team is the people that want to work on dota the counter strike team is the people that want to work on counter strike you know for all we know the differences could be just one guy on your game 
that's handling all of this stuff by himself. You know, people, there is no glory in, in handling support tickets. Mm. And ultimately, like what, from the perspective of, uh, of Steam, like what does it matter if someone has a problem? Like you might, let's say you lose a user, like who mm -hmm. cares? We, we have, we have 29 million. And when I look at what's happening with Dota, like eh, going all the way back to what I said about my conversation in Boston, it's, it's not about what can or can't happen. It's like, will they, like, do they care enough to do something about it? Mm. And I believe that when sufficiently motivated, they are. Um, and I do hope that the resolution, because you know, there was a lot of feedback about the previous DPC system. And it just happened again this year with no changes, with the exception of the events at the end of the year are front are, are backloaded with like more points. But it's the exact same system. And like the only real benefit from my view to how things work in Dota right now, where effectively the whole schedule is engineered so that division one Dota matches, regardless of the region, never overlap with other division one matches, mm -hmm. which is cool if you were living in say Bellevue, Washington and wanted to make sure you could always watch every game of division one Dota. But the, like, the prize pools are identical, right? We talk about North America, like. I'm not saying the South American Dota scene is less important than the North American one, but like there's a reason Twitch changed their subscriber cost based on your region. And $27,000 split five or six ways in North America is not a living wage to make every quarter. It might be in, in South America, in, in Peru, or let's say in Eastern Europe, in, in Ukraine or Estonia. And this is just, based on like cost of living expenses, like just look at it. I, I was living in Ukraine. I, I had a two bedroom, two bath apartment overlooking the river and, I, and gigabit internet. <clears throat> and I spent $1,000 a month, okay? I'm in Los Angeles now. I, I get a studio apartment that's a shithole. It's gonna cost me like three grand. But this is an oversight, right? Like not to mention, because the season is just so long, six weeks times three, times travel, times the majors. We're talking about like 24 to 25 weeks, like half of the year is just straight up, you're playing the DPC. So there's yeah. no space for an ESL pro league. There's not even space for like third party LAN events because the players have to boot camp for this time because it's arguably the most important. Yeah, the money is low, but this is how you get to TI. So after this ends, this marathon, you don't necessarily want to go fly to a third party land, then fly to the major, then fly right back to boot camp because you don't have time for life. Like we talk about, you know, players being entitled. This is more than professional athletes are asked to commit. Mm. Like real pro football players, your style or mine, do not spend like 10 hours a day training. They, they go to the pitch, they work on some stuff. It's like, two to four hours of, of hard athletic exercise. You do some training, you get some massage, maybe study some film. You get days off during the week. Like uh, in Dota, you've got these guys, like I'll use Ponlo again as an example, leaving their homes in Singapore, being like paid for by his teammates to come to America to then stay there for like three months. Like, no, I, I, I don't know why they do it. It's crazy. You know what? I sit here, why are they doing it, Rich? Like, what the fuck, what the fuck motivates you to do that? And it's the dream. It's I can be the best Dota player. And that's a motherfucking beautiful thing. And I wish that that had more value to our overlords. Because the idea of like your game, this thing you created that's existed for nearly 20 years, still has kids dreaming of participating, dreaming of winning. It's a beautiful thing. And it's something or like that you should nurture not look at with disdain it's like well like it's like a flower trying to grow and it's like ah look look we watered you all right do you want more water like you you stop talking so much like just 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 give someone else access to the water make it so that your ti eats a fourth of the calendar not the whole thing 
Ah, oh, it. Well, you know, I know what Valve's argument to all of that would be, and that is that they create the value by having the mages and having in particular TI, which all of the narratives you're talking about, about becoming the best Dota player and all of that work and all of that sacrifice, generally the way Valve kind of passed that is that uh, you get the life-changing money if you win a TI or if you place well at a TI. And, and that's it. It's a tournament where you win it once and you're now a, a, a millionaire overnight after taxes. Mm -hmm. And there you go. That's your reward for a lifetime of effort, essentially, in one potential tournament. Now, for me, and, and this is a point I've made many times, and I don't know if the Dota community are ready to sort of accept it. <clears throat> if Valve do rip off the Band-Aid one day, and decide out of the blue, we're not going to do TI anymore because it's just not fun to be criticized. By the way, spoiler, they're never going to do that because as long as Gabe Newell plays Dota 2, there yeah. is an incentive at the... This is real. This is real talk. Valve like to pretend they're like some fucking mysterious company that does things so differently to everybody else. Like, the bottom line is you still fucking fluff the boss. You still do what the boss likes. And and, and and he could say, oh, it's a flat management structure. Gabe's the fucking boss. We all know it, right? So as long as Gabe Newell has an interest in Dota 2, there will be people who work at the company that will dedicate resources to making Dota 2 better, if not even just because they like the game, but because there's a clear incentive to do it. So that's bullshit, by the way. The, the idea that they would ever pull the plug on it is nonsense. But let's say they did. I actually think there's a world where... I think the Dota community that might not accept this, but the scene, the overall competitive scene, the overall tournament system would be better off. You take a massive initial hit because loads of players would go, well, no TI, what's the point? And they quit. Yeah. Seeing that happen in multiple esports in my time, where the big tournament goes under and everyone goes, well, what's the point? And they leave and they fuck off. And what you're left with is all the sickos <laughs> the lunatics that just want to be good at a game that doesn't necessarily pay. Yeah. And then what happens is eventually that dedication leads to like a grassroots thing. You start getting content, you start getting leagues, you start building it up. And suddenly you have, um, you have a, you have a scene that makes more sense structurally because there's not this one big tournament that you have to win that or it's all been a waste of time. Yeah. And this is where, you know, I'll admit, like, I was just wrong um, because I always thought when I was playing, um, I had the mentality like, look, this is Dota. This is competition. You know, uh, you earn it. And this is the best esport because it's pure, right? Mm. We don't get some lofty salary. We don't get, you know, no one's making content. I don't have to give a shit about my YouTube. Mm. I just have to win. And if I win... I will have the glory. I'll have the, you get everything. You get the money, the fame. Like we, as Dota 2, I think the proportion of viewership in terms of the esport share is the esport share is higher in Dota than in any other esport. And the top streamers in Dota, with the exception of like two, and even they are like still 0.01% players, they're all the best pros. Like you want viewership? Get mm. good. Go win a TI. But that wasn't healthy. And as a talent, I am like, I was so much happier. Oh my God. Playing, I would, you know, we were living in a team house. We weren't getting much salary. And when you lose, it's like you're, you're fucking losing at life. You know, your self-esteem is crushed. I'm not, I'm not making money. I'm, I'm not good enough at my passion. And there's nothing to fall back on. Like you just, you're just miserable. Mm. And that's, that's just not healthy mentally. Like it, it, I was a depressed person as a player. I was not happy as a Dota player. There was memes about this uh, just recently that um, one of the three like words for the category of Dota was depression on Twitch. And, and all these- uh, Sounds about pros, right, honestly. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's these pros, like it's a meme that you make your Steam name something like, um, like just something really emo, like just, <laughs> it's just sad. Right. And, and it's not healthy and I've totally changed my tune and I understand why people would disagree and why they would agree with past versions of me. Like, Hey, if you want to make money, get good. This is a privilege that you get to do this 
you know, it's a hell of a lot easier than, than these other jobs that exist. But I just think that we can do better and we can provide more in the game that we love to the people coming in late, right? Our top players, our millionaires, they're all approaching 30. There's still teenagers that want to play this game that are really fucking good at it. And I want to incentivize them so that they pick this game that I love instead of all these other ones. But right now, I would still tell people I care about, my, my youngest brother, like, do not play professional Dota. Go to, go to Valorant. Go to Counter-Strike. Go play Fortnite. Try to be a variety streamer. All of these are still hard, but there's much, it's much more forgiving. You might make it to the top 100, the top 500, and be able to make a living. And that's just not the case in Dota 2. Mm. So um, uh, there was a lot of focus on how the communication sort of works, that it seems to be you have to kind of piss Valve off to get their attention. Um, or they just drop an announcement on you. Um, and and I, I, again, I find this surprising because one, one of the things about Valve I, I have said and will continue to say is that while they might be ahead of the curve in, in some areas, you know, like they might have, they might make incredible tech, uh, you know, the Steam platform. Obviously, if you're a gamer, you owe Valve uh, a huge debt just for the existence of Steam. Because if you remember what it was like to have to go to fucking GameStop or something, you know, that was a an ordeal. Uh, so, you know, good on them for all of that. But they're they're massively anachronistic in their esports approach, in my opinion. Like when you look at other developers that have an esports product and they understand the benefits of having an esports product, they have dedicated teams to the esports department. They have a point of contact. They generally have a public facing, you know, I don't want to say community manager because that's the most wretched, servile job in the whole games industry. Being a community manager means you reply to forum posts until you say something wrong and then you get fired and you make like, <laughs> and, and you make yeah. minimum wage the entire time. It's fucking ass. So I'm not talking about a community manager, but. You know, I thought, again, my understanding was Valve were going to head in that direction and have a point of contact. I remember when Bruno got hired, I thought, right, it's going to be Bruno. Don't even know where that motherfucker is these days. Like, I, haven't, I can't remember the last time he posted or said anything. It, it seems to be he's disappeared. They obviously brought in Casey. They brought in Slack. So I'm like, okay, good. People from Endemic into the scene who've contributed to TIs and done it surely they're going to be able to tell us something. And obviously I'm sure if they were here, they'd say, listen, definitely not in our remit and not in our purview, not why we were, not why we were brought in at all. So, you know, why isn't there just a one, and Eric used to, I, I, mad respect to Eric Johnson, by the way. Um, why isn't he the guy? There has to be somebody like that just has, to, you can't do it this way anymore where people are just in the dark fumbling through guessing what's going to happen next. If you want to run a fucking esports circuit, you have to have a dedicated point of contact as a minimum. But you're, you're, you're operating under the assumption that this is some priority. Like the only thing that valve owns in terms of like, product is is the international and the international has more money and more viewers every year um i remember having another conversation with a guy from valve at a uh, ti8 in shanghai and i we we're just shooting the shit you know i am just talking about the broadcast and like things that i felt like could have been improved or i, I can't remember the specifics but he, he looked at me, he like listened. And then he said, I get where you're coming from, Kyle. And he like beckons out because we're overlooking from a booth. He look, he's like, but look at this. No one does it better. So why, why would we change something when we're the best? Like we are the best. And, and this, this isn't really how I think. This isn't how a lot of competitors think. Um, you can win a series and still feel like you could have done a lot better. And like, this is my mentality. And if you combine this with what I believe is the core like position internally, which is that this scene exists out of our benevolence, right? You know, I appreciate that great intro that you gave me, okay? Um, 
And I like to think that I'm someone who's not just like some schmuck that gets thrown up on camera that anyone could do. I like to think that like I'm skilled at my craft. You know, mm -hmm. I take it seriously. I, I talk to my colleagues. I talk to my superiors. I watch other shows and other esports. I've watched hours of Johnny Carson just to like get a feel for certain things regarding timing. And I'm still not like, I'm not great. I don't think, but I try to be. And it's just about whether I don't, I don't feel like that's the valve uh, read on me, on my craft, or even on a player and what they do, hmm. because we are not talented competitors or, or tradespeople. We are just existing in a sandbox that they have created. And it is, it is, I should be grateful for the opportunity and not think that it was me or me being special or being talented that got me to where I am. It's, it's a privilege to work in Dota that Valve grants you and they can take it away if they want to. So, you know, a common theme it was also in the, a couple of Twitter posts. This has been a, a theme through all of these team meetings because every year at TI, there's a meeting between Valve and team owners, Valve and players, Valve and talent. Mm. And the key thing is that you're always discuss your partners. You, we are your partners. And this is the internal messaging. Like, you know, we are partners with Valve, but it really doesn't feel like a partnership, right? Like even when you, when you talk about these fan bundles, as an example, just to give background to viewers that don't watch Dota, you now have the ability to sell fan packs for your DPC team, which reward you with in-game activations. So tier one is like bronze. You get some, uh, some emojis and stuff. Tier two, you get fan sprays. Tier three is really cool because you get voice lines so that you can actually use voice lines in game which are famous like everyone's seen voice lines during ti mm -hmm. that are submitted by your team and you get 50 percent of the revenue but what people don't realize is like when these were launched there was a week there was literally a week from we're doing this and submit all of this within a week and when people were like well can we, can we have a little more time like we have to get other people on this they're like they basically said like you don't have to submit it if you don't want to like, this is an opportunity we're giving you. We don't have to. You have a week. So this canceled weekends for, for teams, right? If you have a Dota team and you're S tier, you're shit. You're grinding at it right away. Yeah. The other aspect of that is you only get a maximum of three voice lines into the game. But you have to submit 10 and Valve choose the ones that get in. Not you. This isn't like, here's our fan pack. Give us approval. This is, here is like more content than you'll take and you pick what you like. And that doesn't really feel like a partnership to me. No, and, like, and on, on that point, um, I mean, I, I'm amazed I'm about to say this about Valve of all companies, but because, you know, historically, I think they've been one of the best games developers in terms of knowing where the line is uh, in their expectations from you and allowing you to have the freedom to exist around their game. Like, you know, by way of a, for instance, you know, Riot Games <clears throat> will just drive you out of the community and they'll leverage any dirty fucking tricks they can do to do it. Uh, to give you an example, just in case some Dota people, because I know they all love Riot Games, in the Dota community, because their marketing around League of Legends was absolutely fucking disgusting and remains uh, just abhorrent. But to to give you an idea of how bad they'll go, um, I broke a story or attempted to break a story about it was when uh, the big partnership at the time, D-Man and Joe Miller, were essentially going to break up and, um, you know, join ESL and all of this stuff. And I did it very professionally. I went to them to ask for a statement, and they basically uh, uh, fucked me over. And they didn't. They said, yes, we'll give you a comment. And then they rushed out the news, so I lost the scoop. And there was an email, there was an email chain distributed internally saying, we can't let Richard Lewis break League of Legends news. And they were that 
because they fucking despise me because I'm one of the few people <laughs> I actually call out Riot Games for being a shower of cunts. And so you don't watch on the subreddit either, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, <laughs> imagine that. Imagine imagine having the time if you're a successful games developer to interact with gremlin moderators from Reddit to essentially <laughs> silence the critical voice. Like, uh, grow the fuck up. Anyway, so I got that email and I publicized it. And I was due to work an event for ESL, who at the time, it was an Intel Extreme Masters. And Intel Extreme Masters at that time used to be the only tournament outside of Riot themselves for League of Legends. They used to do the IEMs. And uh, I was due to go, and they told ESL, if Richard works, I was working a StarCraft event, so not even their game. And they told ESL, if Richard Lewis attends that event and is adjacent to our product, even though I'm working essentially for Activision Blizzard, a rival developer, they will revise their entire partnership with ESL and maybe pull the game from them. So I got an email from ESL basically saying, you can't work this event. Don't worry, we'll pay you for the time. Have a holiday. So that's the depths Riot Games will go to. And I am not alone in that. Valve, they just don't give a fuck. Said something stupid on Twitter, whatever. You can go work for ESL, no problem. We don't care. We've got better things to, to, to do with our time than worry about esports politics and other tedious nonsense. So I've always understood that they get what the, the partnership is, which is I will give you my skills. I will bring the game to life. I will generate interest in your product. I will extend the lifespan of your game. Not just me, but obviously I'm talking everybody who works in think- esports. That's what we do. And in exchange for that, you shut the fuck up and let me do it. And you will reap 10 years of rewards. In my case, 16, 17 years of Counter-Strike content generating interest in the game for you, which might encourage people to, oh, I don't know, fucking play it. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the quid pro quo. So Valve have always got that. Other games developers are fucking deluded narcissists who think because they made a half successful video game, they're like gods. They're the next Steve Jobs or whatever. And therefore they like say to you, you better be a good little boy or you don't get to create content about our video game for free in your spare time. We'll take away your right to even do that. Valve have never done that. Now, increasingly, it looks like Valve are becoming the same kind of petulant, emotional games developers that, you know, fuck up esports from the ground up. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, first of all, I, I mean, I'm sad you didn't end that statement with I am esports. I know, right? I mean, yes, but I, I think that... I've uh, transcended of- even that. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't need to tweet it. I just project it. <laughs> Yeah. I think publishers would listen. I think a lot of publishers would listen to that and kind of laugh. Um, and not to say that like I'm laughing at you with them, mm. but um, that's that's how I feel um, when I would. Uh, that's what I felt over the last year, like working Dota events. Is you know, community players like tos like you feel. I feel valued. I feel that I am. Uh, like a valued member of the community. Um, I don't really feel that way ever uh, when I work uh, on a, on a valve IP on a, on a valve product. And uh, I think TI is probably my least favorite event to work. Um, I think this last one was, was miserable for a lot of reasons, but I'm not going to get too much into that, but there's, there's I'll probably things... make you get into that. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, so, so it's tough because a lot of this is like my friends and colleagues and I don't want to use anyone else's experience. Like I want it to just be me. Right. Cause sure. you know, I, I don't think valve is above saying to some TO like, Hey, don't work with that guy. Or, or we would suggest, cause end of the day, you, you are like valve of an entity of unlimited power. So a suggestion from them might as well be a direct order because otherwise you're, you're not really being a good partner if you don't mm-hmm. listen to your partner and do what they tell you to do. Mm-hmm. But there were little things that frustrated me. And this is verifiable if you like just go watch the broadcasts, but you had like new people, um, first ever broadcast. TI is a big deal to Dota fans. Like pretty much everybody you see on TI, like maybe you haven't seen them 
until like this year or the year before, but they've probably been in Dota for a long time. And working at TI is kind of a dream. So when I see like these rookies doing not one, not two, not three, but like all four series in a day. And then there's a veteran like, um, like, I don't know, I'll use me as an example. I consider myself a veteran. I won't use anyone else's name. If I'm doing one series and someone else is doing four today and four tomorrow, or even just little things that I think, you know, as a TO, you try to avoid like doing first and last, right. Mm. Getting in at 8 AM and then also having to be live at 10 PM or working the last series and then having to come in for the first, like, these are all things we try to avoid. Um, every TO tries to avoid these things. At TI, it's just sleep is certainly not a consideration in how the schedule is made. Um, this is feedback I've given multiple years, and I, I don't see that changing anytime soon. And again, this is where you'll have pushback, like, oh, isn't that like entitled? It's a dream. Yes, it is. And I think that people want to be comfortable and they should be set up for success. Mm. I think like the role you'll have at TI is like, you know, if, if, if you get hired for a CSGO event, Richard, they tell you what you're going to do, right? Uh, I mean, it's essentially, I mean, generally, yeah, you know what days you're going to work, you know what the schedule looks like. Yeah. We, we, we routinely are getting like next day's schedule. Um, yeah, I, 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 I like... heard this over in TI and I also heard as well, there's this weird like tryouts like in fucking Batman, yes. you know, with the snap pool cue on the floor uh, yeah. aspect to it where based on how they feel, you know, Friday went, uh, that yes. will inform who gets series and gets to commentate on Saturday, which seems yes. a crazy system to me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like little things. Like, uh, I mean, I guess I already started this. So like there was other things where um, my co-caster got sick at this event. Mm. So I, we cast a single, I think two BO1s and then we weren't working together. And I got asked, um, his replacement was like a different play-by-play -play caster. And I got asked on two occasions to replace, like basically to work with them, like, hey, go cast this series with this guy instead. Mm. And I said, like, look, I I'll do that. But, you know, this is a, a big opportunity for, for these, these people that are going to be casting like main stage TI, right? Like you've made it. I think that you should ask their them who they want to cast with because both of them had their duo their partner at the event mm. and they weren't asked like hey who would you like to cast with i was just said hey can you like you're gonna work this series with them and i pushed uh on one occasion because i'm like look i i get this i will do it but i really think that people when they're comfortable are going to be set up better for success and i think that you know, they should have some input into who they go work with in their one opportunity to cast like me. Yeah, of course. I mean, dude, like, so, you know, I've, I've learned this the, the hard way. Um, things that you think are good in your brain don't always pan out. <laughs> you know, I know that's like a mad concept to people. You can believe something's a good idea and then it could be a real fucking yeah. bad idea, right? And so I used to work as a director of talent and uh, over at WSOE, and uh, we ran a Dota event, and that was where, you know, we had, like, um, Sue Mail and Arteezy did some analysis work. Great to work with them, super nice guys. Obviously, I brought Moxie in over there. I think she's great. Happy to, very happy to see uh, all the success she's had. Um, you know, and I kind of fucked her over a little bit at that event because I, I put her with a partner she'd not worked with because I thought it would work in my brain, and it didn't um and they didn't have any synergy and of course what then happens is when you sell your talent short like that and that's my failing my mistake they get the criticism they get they the get hate it. yeah, yeah exactly. you're immune no one knows it was your call yeah. no one knows that you're and the it's, it, this it's not it's not hours. a great feeling uh, honestly because <laughs> you you know if you if you self reflect you realize you've you've let them down essentially you know yeah that's a, that's how i feel as well and that's um as you said, it's just, it's one of those things that's just kind of overlooked. Um, and 
I again, I it's not like this huge issue. I just think it's a problem that all stems from like the same root cause, which is that you know we're told that we are partners as teams, as players, and as talent, but we are not. We are not equal partners. Yeah, it's and a very one-way partnership yeah, by the sound of it. I, I, I'm not even saying like, hey, um, like I won't do that. Like, listen to me. It's just like maybe you should ask your partner. Like, just with instead of making the decision in the back room with a bunch of people that don't throw more than one event per year, like talk to the people that love your game and have worked in it for years and ask their opinion. Like at least have that floating when you go and decide our fate in the back. Mm. That's all. And that's something that it just it's just strange to me because it's just not how it's done in any other event in with any other organization, right? When I go work for for a TO, be it a uh, WePlay or PGL or ESL or Dota Pit or Star Ladder, like we're working with the people making the show mm. and, and you can discuss like bits you'd like to do or roles you'd like to try out. It's not just handed to you, right? Like, you know, the <laughs> role, you don't know what you're doing at TI until you show up. And that, yeah, this is like all just, I think personal peeves cause I'm a talent, but we don't have to go into it too much. But it really, it really just grinds my gears because I love my community. I love the people I work with. Um, I care a lot about the players and the talent that mm. I've known for, for years and years. And I, I want what's best for them. Or at the, the very least, like I want them to feel like what they're doing matters. Like, like they are valued people. Like they are skilled you know, I look at, I look at guys and I think like how, how lucky I am that my game that I love gets represented and has people like, you know, slacks or mm. OD pixel working in it. Like these guys are fucking geniuses. You know, they are so good at what they do. And, and I want them to have, to feel like that, you know, I want them to feel like they are they are special and that we, we might not be able to do this without them and that the scene and the game would be worse without them in it. Same goes for these players coming up, trying to, uh, trying to make it. Mm. I, I want them to feel special and I want them to be motivated to pursue their dreams. It breaks my heart when I read a tweet from a guy who's, who's the mid player on like the second best team in Europe, who, who's got, um, you know, I, I'd have to check, but it's like, you know, his, his tournament winnings are in four or five figures. And here he is in Europe taking down people like Puppy, people like Kuroki, who have five million plus in earnings that have been dominant for years and years. And he's on Twitter saying, fuck, did I, I feel like I'm like, am I wasting my life? Like, cause he grinded. You might not see these guys at the top of the leaderboard for some time. It takes a while to get good at a game, especially one as complex as Dota. Mm. And that's also why we see response, why there will be something that Valve ends up doing, because this is so much that they have to respond. But I don't think this should be the case. I, I feel like we should have some, like, th like it just, this can't be how it has to be. Well, I mean, but just just to rewind to to the point you made, uh, because it ties in. Now, obviously, you know, TI, like you say, it's Valve's big, you know, tournament. It's the jewel in the crown, and um, obviously, they take a lot of pride in it. But I was, I was, I was I'm very surprised at this idea that uh, they were upset by public criticism around the event and criticism from talent. Uh, and criticism from teams and attendees. Because let's be real, okay? Let's just be real. And again, and Valve, they do actually watch my content, um, and generally they, they they seem to not mind me. I think they tolerate me. Uh, but maybe not so much now with, with sort of what I'm about to say. I can't believe, <laughs> I can't believe for a second they had any pride in the last TI. 
Uh, it was it it looked awful on the first few days, especially terrible oh. lighting, terrible oh backdrops, cheap broken tables that looked like they'd been picked up in a fucking you know like fire sale from a shut down school. Um, oh, you, I, it, it, can it, I interrupt it, real quick? Yeah, they, sure. It looked were, it looked like, terrible initially. We were casting outside, like. We didn't. Um, we, I remember we asked for heaters for a couple of days, but like you know, you wanna you don't want to make waves. So no one's like, if this is if this is again is like a to, we're gonna be like, hey, we need some fucking heaters outside. It's freezing, mm. and we're gonna get them. We're all a little, you know, everybody. You're kind of you're a pussy, ti. Cut that. You're um, <laughs> you're you're afraid to give this kind of uh, criticism. So you'll hear like people sound kind of hoarse. It's because it's like thirty or forty degrees Fahrenheit. And they're outside, like wearing coats, casting. Mm. Um, there was issues like people uh, when they checked in and were first to quarantine, like there just wasn't water, like weird stuff that just I think is handled differently if it's um, if it's somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and and also, sorry, I I don't know why you, you can continue with your monologue. No, I mean, look. So uh, it it looked terrible. It looked cheap. I mean, I'm, I'm I have run events, so I'm I'm a stickler for these types of things. So I thought it looked terrible. I mean, first of all, in a shot, just have it evenly lit. You know. Um, now I know obviously people are going to be looking at the lighting in my room. This is just because you know, I'm fucking. Uh, I don't like bright lights in my in my face as a rule. But on a show, you need good lighting, right? So you need that. Uh, you, th that didn't happen. It wasn't particularly well framed. It looked awful. The backdrops looked up. It looked like a 2014 LAN. It looked like a standard cheap LAN event. And then obviously you had the issue around just the weird setup of how you've got somebody out there doing like an interview with a player in a big empty stadium. And the reason that you're doing that is because the reason you're still doing it literally physically in the stadium is because they've already built the augmented reality weeks prior and they still want to use it. So you have this really weird fucked up artificial artificial setup. It doesn't even make logistical sense. There was a ton of stuff like just in terms of the practicalities of getting yeah. Frankie out there and stuff that basically fuck so Frankie well, down the river. It's also, I mean, the hosts like the hosts were never actually inside the arena. Mm. The the arena is here, mm -hmm. and then there were tents for each broadcast, like maybe a yeah. hundred meters away, that the whole show was from. So, and I understand like esports might go this way. This is just us, I think, as broadcast professionals, like disliking the direction. But like this is not uncommon. But it is definitely more fun, and I think a better product to have yourself with like a real background versus yeah. where we're going, where you just have a full green screen studio. And that, that is what we had. People so, do the green screen stuff because it's cheaper. It's cheaper. And obviously for like sponsor activations and shit, you're going to have a bunch of crazy graphics flying around. Mm -hmm. So so it just makes sense to do it that way. But I agree with you. I mean, like, oh, shit, don't even get me started because I'll just bore all the fucking listeners. But, yeah. you know, the, 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 the reality is that actually we are going more towards that, that cost effective direction. Yeah. And people are going to be saying, oh, it's because of COVID. It's because of COVID. Fuck off. It's just a wet dream for tournament organizers to save money. I mean, you could, they know you'll talk that viewers will tolerate an inferior product, but back to, yeah. back to the, the, the yeah. point I'm making, which is, you know, so you had that, that's just the talent stuff. Then yeah. it's fucking embarrassing when you have like team spirit tweeting out, like, look at our practice rooms. These are the conditions. Um, DPC ranking points decide whether you get toilet roll or not. Um, and, and so for valve to turn around and go, yeah, could you not do that publicly? Because it makes it not fun for us. Now, I agree. You should back channel before you go public with stuff like yeah. that. But equally, the person well, you should direct your anger well, to in that situation is fucking PGL. So real quick, and like this is why I'm saying like it isn't a lack of, uh, of ability. It is a lack of fucks. Mm. And when Valve is motivated, they will they can move mountains, right? That practice room thing was an issue. So they went to a hotel as like part of the same group and paid who knows how much to kick people out of their rooms to cancel like bookings so that we could then, you know, have these teams moved into those rooms. Who knows how much this cost? Yeah. But the problem is like the, the question we have is, would this have happened 
if it weren't public, if it weren't number one on Reddit, and if there weren't people looking at that and laughing like, ah, $40 million tournament, ha ha ha. Yeah. And I'm not sure because, you know, the major was canceled. And that was how it was. And I don't believe that they expected, like I, I found the tweet, I'm gonna read it because it's actually worse than I thought. This yeah. is from Boom Dota, the, the mid player for what is now the second best team in Europe according to DPC rankings. I think that when I'm on my deathbed, looking back at my life, the decision to commit my entire youth to trying to become a Dota 2 pro will be the worst one I've made in this life. Yeah, that and, sucks, and that's, right? That's like a, what could be a new superstar. And, hmm. and this despair like kind of ignites the community. Quinn Dota, number one in, in NA, had something similar. He like broke down crying on his stream. And, and that's where I think you know, the community gets behind this because they realize you know, these, aren't, these aren't entitled millionaires. Right. These are pro players that have been grinding since like age 14, five years later, here they are. They're finally in a position where they can start making money, where they can go to valve tournaments and it's just canceled. And it's like, yeah, we'll just, we'll just do it later. And, and this is something, you know, but like, why is it that it has to get to this point for something to happen? And it just comes back to um, the motivations. Mm. If there isn't, uh, you know, and this is what the, you can't, you can't tell a, on one hand, like, hey guys, please don't go public. Talk with us about this directly. Like nothing fucking happens. Nothing fucking happens when you send emails to the void that is the Dota team at Valve. The, but the moment something goes public and there's sufficient outcry, we see solutions in two days. So, so what are you really saying? You know, like your words. Yeah. Are if you thing, want, but... if you want it to work, if you want it to be that you back channel to us, uh, then that, yeah, that, that process has to work, obviously. Exactly. Or we're if just not going to do it. Yeah. 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 Um, like... Here's a question for you, just while we're at this point, why is it then? Um, Cause that, right. I think by and large Dota two talent are pussies and they don't speak up enough about issues um, and I totally get why, uh, because they all want to do a TI and they're super afraid, you know, if we speak out about certain issues, we won't do a TI. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this a bunch down the years and th that is what it is. So why, why is it that you're not, why, you're not cut from that same cloth? Why is it you feel like I can speak up about this and what happens, oh. happens? Oh, a couple of reasons. Like, I feel like uh, in my, in what I write or even what I say, like, I'm not really being abrasive. I think it's just like, this is how it is. You know, the, the post I wrote when TI was canceled, like it's the elephant in the room. It's like, it, it was October, right? TI was supposed to be in August. It was canceled. It was like two and a half months later. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what, like, what the fuck is happening? And all the team, like everyone is thinking this in the Dota scene, like what's going on? So I don't think writing about it is, um, is really out of line, right? Um, and I'll be honest, like I, I'm, I'm looking, at, I'm kind of moving on, uh, which is part of why I'm like coming on your show even, because, you know, I'm not sure if I was doing this from the ESL DPC league, Mm -hmm. which I worked last season. I don't know if I come on this show because it's, it's iffy. Right. Um, and ultimately, I don't know. I think that you've got to, if you see something that that's affecting the people you love, like you have to say something about it. Mm. Like you have to at least try. Right. I, I always feel bad because when I, when I was in Han, like I love that game. I uh, it's a game no one, none of you watching remember Heroes of New Earth, right? But it was the third MOBA that didn't go free to play, so we lost. We had Ice Frog, okay? Yeah. And they wouldn't give him creative control, so we went to Valve. And I was really fucking good at that game, and I watched it die, and I I didn't really work hard enough to to save it. Um, I mean, to be fair, me, S two did like everything fucking I mean, wrong. It was I, you want to talk about developers fucking up, like Jesus. 
Uh, there, there's a case study for you right there and what not to do, honestly. We, they spent, there's this tournament they threw in Vegas. They spent over $20,000 on bottled drinks. Mm. Because instead of going to Costco and picking up a crate, they like bought, you know, these little branded bottles like yay big for like 10 bucks a piece from the casino. Don't even give me, just leave that. Yo, the I love that thing. event though. It's one of my all-time favorite esports events. That 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 host who's I like, won that tournament. Vegas. I, I won that event. Fuck. That's Bro. my that should be my glory, right? And instead it's number two all-time esports cringe, right? And that was me. That was I won that. I worked real fucking hard to get there. I flew an Australian, a German, and a Swede into an apartment. We had a, an apartment in Miami Beach, me and my brother. We got another apartment to like put people in, we would eat in one of them, walk across in slippers to the gaming one. And, and we did all of this just to win. It was like $32,000 we won. And, oh my God. Did you break even? <laughs> I, when I left Han to start playing Pro Dota, I, had, I, was, I was break even. Like I had like two grand, I was leaving the apartment, I had to move back in with my dad to become a Pro Dota player. But you know what? It was, I, I wouldn't, I would do it again. Uh, maybe not. I probably would have gone to play League of Legends if I had known what I know now. But, you know, I, uh, I had my opportunity to hold the big check on stage with a packed crowd. So that's something that, that I enjoy um, and I'll look back on. It's just a shame, you know, like people are laughing at me as they watch this because it's a meme, you know, like, what did you win? It was like some shit. Some shit game or whatever. But anyway, the other thing is uh, in regards to talent in Dota, mm. like no one cares about your content, right? There's really no way to make a living as a Dota content creator. There's a couple streamers that do it, but like long form content has no real place. And in general, people just care about, about esports stuff. Um, so I don't know. I don't like, I, I love this fucking game, man. I, I don't care if I'm working in it. Um, I'll still watch. I'm, I'm playing, uh, I'm currently a division one North American Dota player um, as part of like a meme team. We're not gonna mm. be division one for long, but I'm not gonna stop playing. Like I love this game. I have like 20,000 hours almost, probably more if you count time, like just watching streams and such. So it, it's not an uncommon opinion right now. Like everyone in the world sees that we have a big issue in the Dota ecosystem and ultimately because of the way this is all constructed, we have, like, there are two options. Either A, Valve says, okay, they start working a little better with their partners and they take control of the scene and they hands on it properly like we see other games do, other developers do. Or they hands off it and let other players and other established vendors in the ecosystem do something so that we can have a product like say the ESL pro league or a circuit that is operated by people that like no offense to valve are sufficiently more motivated to make it work because while a hundred million dollars in profit from the TI compendium might not mean anything to valve it sure as fuck means a lot to any other goddamn company in the space yeah but if the mentality is, well, we're running a successful business. If you can't run a successful business, that's your problem. Like, first off, that's not the attitude I would use towards a partner. But second, it's just kind of callous. And if that's the mentality, and if that's why you're not making things better, then you deserve to be called out. Because mm. I feel that you make a, there's an implicit deal or an arrangement made. If, if you create an ecosystem, you build this game and you get people to give you their youth. You owe it to them, maybe not to like create that golden road and like everyone gets a living wage. And you know, you, if you're a top something Dota player, you should get something like that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you got to just be honest. You got to say, Hey, we're not sure if we're going to do another TI. You got to say that this is, like what, what is going on? Like, I don't think that people playing in a, in a League of Legends franchise feel like their entire career might end in a year. 
and there's just no certainty in Dota. I mean, I the, just, I just, it doesn't the, have to be that way. The, the, re, the reality is over in League of Legends. I mean, funnily enough, uh, I was just talking about this on stream the other night. Um, the, the salaries feel so unbelievably inflated for like where their esports product is for the players over there right now. They make so much money. Um, mm -hmm. when I hear about like league top League of Legends salaries and like look at the average salary and it's like six figures, it's like it's fucking and, and not small six figures, you know, it's fucking staggering. Um, but I agree. I mean, you know, League of Legends isn't going anywhere, and if for any reason it needed to scale down, right, it would have a contingency because they really do disproportionately mm -hmm. compared to Valve value their esports product, they understand it. I mean, for years. Esports for Riot was essentially a lost leader because they understand it creates an aspirational element. There is something seductive about the narrative, right? That by virtue of playing on the ladder, right? Just pick up games, garbage, you know, solo queue. It's just garbage. It's all garbage. You get griefed every game. It's fucking horrific. You just want to blow your fucking brains out while you're playing. It, it's like to sum up the Dota experience, I'm sure everyone can identify with this. Relief when you win, absolute horrific hair pulling despondency when you lose, and the process to either state is deeply unpleasant. So the, when you have league, for example, I'm not saying league's any better, but there's this seductive element that by virtue of being in like the, the ladder, there is a path to pro. And you you can you can get there. There's like a much more, you know. There's there's academy teams. There's like you know grassroots setups. There's collegiate stuff. There's this vast range of things that you can enter into just by virtue of being good in ladder. Yep. Meanwhile, as you say, if you're a Dota player and you're in that and you're in the upper echelons and you're high MMR. You might never play professionally. You might never make any money off streams. There's not really a lot of grassroots tournaments. The ones that are there, small derisory amounts of money. It just feels like the Dota landscape is way more barren than even a hermetically sealed esport like League. Yeah. Well, it's just more top heavy as well. The amount of yeah. money in the scene has gone down progressively for like since 2016, whereas the money at TI is continuing to increase as a proportion of the overall pool. Mm. And a part of this as well as you know, Riot, like, yeah, League of Legends is like their game. That's their product. Uh, with Valve, Steam is the product. Dota is just this cool game that Gabe likes and that they love. And TI is like a really cool thing. And and that's just the mentality. Like, when you, uh, when was this? Back at, this is something I wrote about a couple of years ago, but back at TI5, when they started doing fantasy, like you mm -hmm. could have a fantasy team during TI, they had player cards. Mm -hmm. And they had, you know, my face on it. It was my brand, my complexity gaming team and complexity EG, a couple other teams said, Hey, you know, you're using our IP and you're selling these packs of cards in game. Like, can we discuss like a revenue share or something like this? And the response was very, very curt. Um, oh, we're sorry. Uh, we didn't realize you'd have a problem with that. We can take it out if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. I heard and, that too. yeah. and then there's like, when it comes to these fan packs, the, the, Fan pack announcement to submit by was a week. So again, if you don't want to do it, okay, don't. Um, but then the, the it, it just comes into like, what's it's, it's about having it less work. It would be work to work with each of these like 96 teams to discuss which of their, you know, hey, this voice line doesn't work. It's a little like, it's too much. It's too flame or whatever. So how about this one? And like the team's picking the three that they're selling in game for, uh, 50 50 revenue cut like that doesn't happen but that would be like that would require someone to spend extra days that could be better spent on some other product so what happens is everybody submits it i imagine there's like a few guys in a room they break out the beers and they just go by the teams like one by one like okay this is good i like that one more okay cool that's what they get there's no insight from the teams about pricing you know i mm. i think there should be price differences it's a it's 20 dollars a season to support your team. Doesn't matter whether you're an NA team, an SA team, what have you. And effectively everything expires. It's not something you're owning, you're renting it for the duration of the six week season. Then the voice lines expire and you've got to buy them again. So you're, you're asking effectively your fans to give you the cost of a brand new like AAA title video game to rent voice lines from you for the year. 
and you don't even have like the input to get what it, you want into it. it. It's just, that's how I went bold. It, it just, it, it's just the messaging. Like we, I, we don't feel like partners. I want to be a partner. Like I, I would, I, I want Dota to live. I want to be old, like watching Dota. God forbid working on Dota, right? And I just, and the the same, like I'm telling people like right now that like work on camera or, or thinking about like, you, you need to diversify. Like you cannot tie your career to the, to a video game. And I think that this is not just true of Dota. I think it's true of, you know, essentially any game because we're not operating in a, in an open ecosystem. Like ultimately it doesn't matter who the publisher is. They are God, like they own it. Yeah. If they don't want you to touch their product, you won't the end. Um, and then this is, you know, more of a philosophical discussion about like, is that okay? Like do publishers, and it really, it all comes back to like the same point, which is does, do you think valve owes the stakeholders, the players, the talent, TOs that have invested time, energy, and efforts into this game, do they owe them anything? Mm. And you can make an argument that no, they don't. And that's that, really. And if that's how you feel, like whatever we get, we get, smile, wave, and, and hope it continues. Because, you know, I'm a, uh, like, yeah, I, I, I don't like this because that makes me a leech, not a valued member of a community but somebody who is just siphoning off value from a company that's created something great and has chosen to share a little bit of it with me. Um, and at the end of the day, right? Like I'm, I'm a college dropout. I don't really have life skills. Um, I was a professional Han player, a professional Dota player and a professional Dota talent. That's not really a amazing resume. I don't respond to emails very promptly. I, you know, I, I do I, actually for for me, I, you know, I, I it's like I say, I, I think it's a, my, my view on esports ecosystems, having worked in a lot of them is, you know, I, I take I take the middle ground. I don't think you owed anything by the developer. I really don't. Um, uh, but equally, I want the developers to not be precious around p people that create something. Uh, external to their game like so when when we talk about esports right like you know it's it's like the classic you know esports pyramid right at the bottom that's what that's the entry level people who just play the game essentially for fun and want to be good at it and then you essentially scale up until you get this esports purist at the top and basically the numbers you know at each stage you filter them out and so it's super important to have like a, a good game and a, and a lot of players so you can get a decent conversion rate. Because in reality, the number of people playing a game to the number of people that will get into esports, become an esports viewer, become a competitor, it, it's very, it's tiny. It is yeah. tiny. And so what I want developers to really be concerned with and where I want them to funnel their energies into is just making good fucking games, creating content around the game. Just keep having that churn, keep bringing new players in by having a cool product. If you've got the time to like petulantly, oh, well, this guy criticized this on Twitter, so he can't ever work a broadcast event, even it's, though it's for a separate company, or this person said something bad in solo queue, so we need to have a meeting with them and berate them and say, because your talent, that you're held up to a higher standard than anyone else in the player. But if you've got time to do this shit, you're not doing something else. And so that what I want developers to do is just let the esports people make cool esports shit for your games. Let us do that. We'll make you money. We'll make money and we'll grow something cool. Once you start playing the, ah, but it's our IP card and we want input and we want this and we want that. Once you start sticking your fingers in the esports gumbo, you better know what the fuck you're doing. And unfortunately, games developers, I think even the ones who have been involved in esports, I don't think they have great esports ideas a lot of the time well uh, you're i think i get where you're coming from but i also think 
we're we tend to like confuse incentives right mm. we look at like sum up the overwatch league in one word failed <laughs> sure was it a failure for blizzard though when they got the 25 million Absolutely. i mean it's, i'm sure it's been financially much, successful yeah the call of duty like that that i'm sure that juiced the uh the returns and the the, the ebitda right mm. that's a win for blizzard so why is it a failure then like this is the thing like we mm. look at it from the perspective of what is the product what's the community but the developer is not incentivized by this they're just making money so this is where it gets money because to blizzard overwatch league maybe it's a little embarrassing but that paid like I, i'm sure bobby Cotta banked like some bonuses based off that oh, and yeah. it's all good it's all good it's gravy so what are we really criticizing right like we're basically saying well the publishers should have done like a better job of like sharing the wealth of like making a better product so that like we would have an easier time making money or making a show or what have you and unfortunately for that to be for that to be a salient point like they have to give a fuck mm. like and and if they don't give a fuck then that's that like and i i look at my game and that's like just what it comes down to. Like even a couple of days ago, there was, um, there was a mod, like a, a secret a patch that came out that just broke a bunch of, of mods that the Dota community created. Mm. Custom games are, are messed up. Uh, I, I think it was a I can't remember the streamer. So at like TI4, TI5, Valve during a player meeting, it said like at some point there would be value in achieving a high position on the ladder. We haven't even had a reset in like three or four years. So it, it's not... Um, I use the, the practice room debacle at TI as an example. It's not that they can't, it's that they just don't care. It, it's like, I, I watched like that scene from Office Space and it's like the perfect visualization of this. <laughs> it, it's, it's not that we're, we're lazy. It's not that I'm lazy. I just don't care. And that's the view of, uh, of what I would say most like, oh, uh, well, man, I've, that's the, that's it i'm trying not to be too harsh you know i'd still like to work in this industry and that's the trouble is that god forbid you you say something out of line or or the wrong person gets gets uh gets eyes on it like suddenly you can just get screwed like the only real way to obtain a, a freedom is to own your own content your own platform and eventually get to such a size that you know in theory you, you can generate value just because people are fans of you and consume your content, which is the advice I give to any talent, any up and coming player is, uh, is something I should have done a decade ago. You know, build your own channels across multiple platforms mm -hmm. because that is the, the path to freedom. And if you aren't willing to do that, then you have to accept that in order to succeed, you will be forced to remain within a sandbox created by the publisher of your choosing and at any moment, you can be denied entry. So, what, 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 what I'll do for you uh, as you commit career suicide. Uh, don't, by the way, don't worry, it's fine. Uh, I, I can, I can highly recommend it. The, the, <laughs> I, I remember the first time I got blacklisted by someone in the industry, and I remember thinking it was like some cataclysmic problem. And then it was just like, oh, wait, no, I'm completely free now to say all the things I've wanted to say without tiptoeing around it. Uh, this is very liberating, actually. So, uh, But anyway, look, just in case you are doing that and Valve are like poised over the delete Kyle from TI's button, um, let's, let's come up with some solutions to the problems uh, that, you know. So they, th you get a call from Valve. They say to you, right, Kyle, we watched that podcast with, with Richard Lewis. We could see how exasperated you were. We're calling you up to the big leagues. Come and fix Dota. We're going to put you in charge of complete autonomy. What would be the things you would implement first? Um, hmm. I feel like there should be, I want to say a cap, but maybe a cap on like the TI prize pool. And I understand it's gonna take a hit the first time the prize pool doesn't increase, 
Mm -hmm. it's been an insane run from like 1.6 million all the way to 40 and change at this last TI. I don't think that people retire if TI instead of 50 million is 25. I think $2.5 million a player is enough money for first place that people will continue to play Dota because ultimately it's still sig it's more value than you'll get doing like anything else. Right. Like maybe, maybe puppy is secretly a, a superstar investment banker. Right. But if it's, if he's not like, he's going to stick with Dota. Mm. I think that the DPC seasons need to either be more like we need more content out of them or we need to make them much more concentrated so that there's more space in the ecosystem for other IPs to develop. Um, you know, you look at like people just want to play Dota. When you make a six week season, they're boot camping for six weeks. Just give them more Dota to play. Like it, it's a good thing for us all. What would you do with the excess money? Roll it over to majors or roll it over to support independent initiatives by, by tournament organizers. Shit. I, I want to see, and I've gotten into a lot of uh, drama with, um, with like streamers, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're re they were rebroadcasting without right. Like the yeah. future, like I want there to be a, a scenario where, where we can have a tournament that is co-streamed by our content creators. Like I want that to be a thing. I think it's healthier. I think that that's better for the ecosystem. And I think it's also representative of like, it's a good message. Like we're all working together in the game that we love. Right now, I can't support that because the TO like has to make money or at least break even for, for this stuff to work. And we've seen TOs like coming to Dota they realize it's near impossible to make a profitable event and, and then they leave. And I, I don't want that to happen. Well, that I was, want... that was an aspect, wasn't it? Because in the Val follow-up response, which I, I believe Cyborg Matt tweeted it out, they said that actually, you know, it wasn't just Omicron. That was a problem. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't find a TO to pick up an event at short notice, which for me is the, the more concerning aspect of it that people don't see the benefit anymore in doing Dota events. And I can tell you from talking to industry people, what you're saying here is effectively right on the money in the sense that there, we can we can run an event. We can't sell the broadcasting rights to a streaming platform, the community, and therefore by extension, Valve don't support, a la the Facebook deal, which, by the way, the Facebook streaming was trash. But it, it made it made money for TO. So I, I I was one of the few voices at the time saying this is a good thing because that is the sports model. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. esports fans are just mega entitled, and if you can't pog champ, platforms bad. Same morons at the time were mm -hmm. saying YouTube streaming was bad. Now they realize yeah. YouTube has better I mean, tech. <laughs> things I was saying at the time as well. So YouTube is the future. So you know, the, it, the, for me, the more concerning aspect to it is that. You can't sell the broadcast rights. Okay. You can't do pay-per-view because esports fans want everything free all of the yeah. time. Um, you, If you're doing Dota, the games are in the client. Anybody can stream them. Valve seems to support that, even with the recent changes. Uh, so you effectively are, you immediately have not one or two potential rivals, dozens, hundreds, infinite yeah. amount. And so, and on top of that, Dota, real talk, it's not the big swinging dick game that all the sponsors want to support in the fucking first place. You don't pull in a big sponsor if you're an ESL, for example. You don't pull it in on the strength of your Dota product or your Dota viewership. So yeah. where the fuck, do, how does anyone make any scratch on this? And it's not a surprise to me that it's like, hey, Val put it out there. Anyone want to do a major at last minute? Not even the usual suspects wanted it. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's because... Again, like you're you're not getting um, like you get half the prize pool. Everything else is on you. All the liability is on you. If God forbid there's a COVID breakout, like you're not going to get any sympathy. That's your fuck up. So yeah, which by the way, the that's risk. another thing. No one wants to be seen to run the super spreader event. Exactly. It's another reason exactly. why they cancel it, right? Yeah, it's um, it's tough. Like we're in a position, like you asked, it, it's not easy to fix, right? And 
I know for a fact, it's much easier for us to sit here and criticize and explain why all these things are bad and wrong. It is really hard to find a solution that works well for all of the, the for all of the stakeholders in an ecosystem. You know, I, I don't have the degrees for this, but I would say that first we need to the, the, the big decision is the fork. Valve, do you want to have control over this? Because we need you to do more. If not, please give us more freedom as the community, as the the TOs and the players and the streamers, what have you to do more ourselves. TI prize, like, you know, we, we used to have TOs, they were itemized, uh, monetizing in-game aspects, right? Of like, you were selling your own compendiums, like Valve took all of that. Yeah. And you have scenarios where, like I, I brought up GESC a couple of years ago, which was a Valve sanctioned miner, two Valve sanctioned miners that the talent and teams have not been paid for. And I feel like, again, it's, it's not the case. Like they don't have liability. They said, okay, GESC, this organizer, you host the tournament and, and we'll give you the IP. Okay, cool. You get half the prize pool. But we, when they just don't have the money and no one gets paid, we can't go to Valve. We we're just, everyone's just out of luck. Mm. And, and that's sort of the same relationship where it's like, okay, it's Valve's choice as to who can and can't host these events. But then if there's issues, like it's, it's not their problem. So either it is their problem and this Dota scene is like theirs and they want it. Okay. Like, like let's go, let's work together. Let's make something happen or at least allow for other products to be developed. Like I look at Counter-Strike and I just see a very hands-off scene. So it allows things like the ESL Pro League to exist, which then allows for this synchronicity and, and a good relationship with, with Blast. And then the points are like tied in together. And it, it just, I don't know what will come of it, but I see the future and I would, I would bet on a future that's being driven forward by people with a vested interest in the game's success. I, it's just, you know, shout out my man, Nahaz, he told me I didn't have to get, I didn't have to go get an econ degree like he did. Okay. If you could just internalize that people respond to incentives. Yeah. This is, if you look at life and you think, why is this person doing this? Oftentimes, if you think long enough about it, you'll understand why. So who is in a better position to drive a scene forwards into the future? Is it a, a company that literally makes so much money that a hundred million dollars isn't a sufficient amount of profit to motivate or B kids, talents, owners, people that love a game so much, they dedicated their lives to it when there was nothing in it for them. Okay. For, for people that would have, were doing this for free and now they've made it their careers. Who do we trust more to push us forwards into the future? I feel like people that don't laugh at a hundred million dollars are more motivated and incentivized to build something because if it failed, they wouldn't have something else to fall back on. They couldn't just go do some other project that would make them $500 million. This is their lives and they want to see it succeed. Not even because of the money necessarily, but because it's tied into their passion and they love to do it. Mm. Um, so look, we're, we're coming up to time. <clears throat> so, I mean, you know, we've had this kind of like, pretty big community um uh you know kind of uh, outpouring of um negative sentiment towards valve about communication about perceived broken promises i want to say i have to laugh a little bit at the community on reddit saying that you know valve don't care about our game and it's like guys i've covered almost every valve game I even attended a Left for Dead tournament when that came out. Ooh, I, I love that game. Yeah. Uh, and so let me tell you, if Valve don't care about Dota, I don't know what that says about CS or TF2 or, you know, mm -hmm. any of the other stuff. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I would say it's at the company, and this probably worrying given everything we've talked about. I would say it's the third priority you know you've got like you know, steam obviously and then like making cool mm. tech slash vr and then probably dota too yeah but um but look so 
do do you think this is like the short sharp shock that valve needed because you know they're getting their ass kicked by riot in a bunch of other games bunch of other areas the community have been really vociferous in their pushback stuff Mm. you're talking about where i know for a fact valve do not like it when pros are saying look i've wasted my life playing your game competitively the one thing they really value is the idea that you can play their games and and make money Mm. and have a living they 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 do prize that so i mean i guess they're probably going to be a little bit shocked by all of this so is that going to be enough for them to maybe revise the culture and make some changes hmm I hope so. Um, but I'm also, you know, if you, I think if you really want to know how people feel, like just look at what they're doing themselves. So like, I obviously have a ton of skin in the game when it comes to Dota and the success, like people who criticize my opinion say like, well, yeah, of course he supports talent and TOs, they pay him. Like this is true, but um, I, I can't say exactly what it'll be. Maybe it'll be out by the time you post this, but like I'm, I'm not going to be looking to have Dota as my primary source of revenue. I'm, I'm going to do something else and I'll still make content and maybe you'll see me at an event um, and I'll, I'll still play. I'll still love the game and watch and go to TI as a fan, but like I will not continue reliant on Dota for my survival alone. Um, and I'm just not comfortable with that anymore. Yeah. I hope that things will change. And I can also tell you, it's not just me who is saying this. It's like, it's team owners, it's, it's players, it's some other talent. Like people are realizing they're waking up to the fact that I am not in control of my destiny. If I continue to keep myself latched solely to this one game and this one company and this one competitive idea. Mm. So do I hope things will be better? Yes. I think that if there were a, a moment where things, where there would be a real catalyst for fucks to begin to be given, this has got to be it. When you have both the old players and the new players all united saying, hey, what the fuck? Like, do you even care? What am I doing here? Um, th- this is going to be the moment. And, and like I said, I know that there's meetings going on, like literally as we were speaking the, between Valve and team owners, managers, players. And we'll see, you know, maybe the major stays canceled, but at least we have better communication moving forwards. Maybe uh, somebody picks it up and is just given extra resources to make it happen. Like who knows? Mm. Um, I hope, I hope that it does. Like, I hope things get better. That's, that's all you can have, but ultimately, and, and it's just, it's all about what does, uh, what does Valve want to do? So, you know, we can uh, we can leave it there. Uh, any final thoughts? Anything you want to add right at the end? Um, any anything to plug? I mean, I always ask that. If you've got anything, are you selling anything? Not yet, but hope uh, maybe soon. We'll see. Okay. Um, I I should have yeah, man. I wish I'd started writing a newsletter like seven years ago. Man, that was that. That's the game right now. Um, Got to get yourself a podcast. That's that's the yeah. big growth industry still. A lot, you know. And you've identified uh, that there's no long form content in Dota because the community is so insufferable. Anyone that tries to create it, they drive them away for a variety of reasons. Like I, I would say final final thoughts is like I will say like, and this isn't to be a sycophant or mm. to try and like stay in the good graces of our overlords, mm. but I am thankful for that that dota exists you know s2 games fumbled but i'm happy that heroes of new earth was a thing um if i look back on my life um and i told 18 year old me who was living with like six other people in a home in foreclosure working for a cokehead manager at a shitty restaurant off the highway that hey you're you're gonna make a living you're gonna be like not just successful, but you'll be able to save money. You're going to travel the world. Uh, You're going to meet like so many incredible human beings that are going to be your friends, like for the rest of your life. I I wouldn't have believed you. I would have said like, this is nuts. And this is all because like this game exists because Dota 2 is a thing. I am allowed to live like a really blessed life. Like, I will 
Um, my dad has always said, you know, a job has to give you three things, at least one, hopefully all three. If you find all three, you're, you're lucky, right? Um, you you want to be able to make enough money to live comfortably. You want to be able to learn and you want to have some sort of opportunity for advancement. Obviously, fun is a factor, but his argument is you can have fun. You'll always have fun. You always make friends at your job. So that shouldn't be the only reason you stay. And I found all three of those things. Like I've met like really incredible people that are like very smart, that are that are doing some really cool things. And and I watch as like these guys I knew at 20 something are growing and creating and building. And and it's really just something special. I love esports. I fucking love esports. I, I never had friends. I was a fucking loser growing up. And all of the good things in my life are really just because of esports and the people that I've met here. So that's why I, I say the shit that I'm saying. That's why I'm here with you. Like I, I obviously I'm going to have some skin in the game and I will, you know, my, my career has been reliant on this existing and I want it to continue, but it's just cause I love it. And I really think a lot of people love it and it's something that's very unique and I don't want to just see like YouTube content creators and their meme reaction videos as the future of gaming, right? I don't want that. I want to see sport at the highest level. And I love Dota and I'm more invested in that than anything else. And I just want the game to live. I want 12 year olds now not to play fucking Fortnite, okay? And do the stupid flossing dance. I want them grinding at this game and kicking Dandy's ass and some SF mid 1v1. And I would continue. That's, that's it. I just love it. I love Dota. And whether or not uh, this is how I make my living, I'm never going anywhere because this is my game. Like, I'm a fan for life. So I hope I can be a fan for life. And whatever the solution that Valve creates or someone else gets to do, I just hope that Dota will exist until I'm really old. All right, there you go. Um, good luck with that. I'll I'll tell you uh, <laughs> on 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 the uh, on the downslope because uh, you know you 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 haven't even had your thirtieth birthday yet, young man. Uh, on the on the downslope, it gets real hard. Uh, it, it's uh, impossible to avoid being jaded. But I I remember I have given similar impassioned speeches. Um, and who knows? Maybe things will change for the better across the industry. Uh, um, I, I am, and I hope I hope you are there. I hope you are there <sighs> to uh, to, so reap, to reap the dividends. So there you are, guys. Kyle uh, from Dota Two, uh, always um, giving it, giving it to people straight. Uh, one of the few people I think in Dota Two that I trust to speak up about their opinions, whether or not you agree with them, uh, at least has the backbone to do it. So be sure to throw him a follow on Twitter. And uh, I thank him so much for his time and being here. Um, and there you have it. Another episode of the Richard Lewis Show in the books. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we'll be back soon. I don't know who with or what it'll be about, but you can be guaranteed it'll be a banger and relevant to your interests. So throw in a follow, all of that Zoom shit, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next episode. Until then, take care. <laughs>